Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Academy podcast, the podcast dedicated to simplifying the commercial real estate industry for the masses. Each week, we sit down with industry experts to dissect the many facets of commercial real estate and extract valuable lessons you can apply to your business. Whether you're a new or seasoned business owner or investor, the Commercial Real Estate Academy podcast will be your go-to resource for all your commercial real estate needs. Now, here are your hosts, Rafael Collazo and Jeff Walston. Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Academy podcast. I'm your host, Rafael Collazo, here with my co-host, Jeff Walston. How's it going, man? It's going great, Rafael. How are you doing today? Cannot complain, cannot complain. Uh, but even if I did complain, I don't think you really, really care. So I'm not going to no. try. No, no. complainers <laughs> over here. Yeah, exactly. So Go sit I try. in the other room. I agree. So that's why I try to avoid complaining at all possible. But um, as far as our guest today, I'm super excited about it. It's actually Adam Ulrey, who's a, who's a buddy of mine that I've gotten to know more and more over the last couple months. I was in a academy with him, with Tyler's Elevate Academy. Uh, so we went through the process together. And he's just an impressive person. You know, he's currently a W-2 employee as a agile coach, which is a methodology that he implements in different uh, businesses. But he also is an investor uh, investing in multifamily assets that have value add in the Southern part of the United States. So as far as the things we dove into in the podcast episode, I found a lot of value in it myself because I personally have a technical background and so does Adam comes from a technical background as well. So the way that we approach our investing is quite similar. Uh, so we talked about some of the advantages and disadvantages of having that technical approach Whereas, you know, we, we can analyze numbers quite, quite efficiently, but there are times where we deal with an analysis paralysis more so than the average person because we really want to have all the information in front of us. So having that mindset and, and just putting it on the forefront was pretty enlightening to me. Along with that, we talked about some of the challenges that he's experienced as he's been starting to scale his, his business and his company outside of his W-2, employ, W-2 work. He started back, I think, in 2019. And since then, they've been able to do quite a few deals uh, with his team. And being able to balance that while also balancing his W-2 work is, is something that uh, he talks about. And I know it's going to be very insightful for a lot of people, in particular, if you're in that position. And then finally, we talked a lot about his podcast. He, he is the co-host of Tech Guys Who Invest, uh, which is a podcast that interviews different people about real estate investing. So we talked about how running that podcast has enabled him to leverage relationships outside of his close-knit sphere. And some have even gotten him opportunities that he wouldn't have had otherwise. So I thought it was an extremely enlightening podcast episode. And yeah, I think without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right into the episode. Adam, welcome to the podcast. Excited to see you, man. Hey, thanks, Rafael. Appreciate you inviting me on. I'm happy to be here. Dude, yeah, of course. No, it's it's great to see you as always. And I mean, we've been involved in a few things in the past, so it's always great to kind of reconnect and everything else. So absolutely. Just to start out in the podcast, what we usually like to do is learn a little bit more about the person we're interviewing. So if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and what your background is, that'd be that'd be great. Okay. Yeah, my name is Adam Yolry, and uh, I have a day job, a W two, as a consultant, and I help large businesses, enterprises, really change the way they do business. So. I help them transform to a more modern way of doing business that really focuses on the customer and uh, being able to rapidly change what you're building to meet the customer's need. And it's called Agile. Those in the software development space are probably familiar with the term. And uh, it's really the way the people in Silicon Valley build software. That's kind of the way I explain it to those not in the industry. I'm an agile coach. So I help businesses learn how to do that and implement it throughout their organization. It's a real big cultural change. In addition to changing the the way your processes work and your approach to how teams collaborate. So I, I bring a lot of that over into what I do when I'm not at work, which is invest in multifamily real estate. And I focus on apartment investing and syndicating deals. I've partnered up with the guys at Dreamstone Invest and uh, they're doing it full time, but uh, as their part-time investor relations guy, uh, I contribute to the team by being their investor relations communication lead, helping bring some capital into the deals and then just kind of helping with some general marketing and things like that. 
obviously you have an interesting background and in that you come from a technical background. And obviously that's not necessarily the typical path for people that, that, that dive into the investing side of commercial real estate. So can you tell us a little bit about what got you interested in commercial real estate to begin with? Because obviously a tech career can be quite lucrative, but I just, I'm kind of curious as to why you found commercial real estate to be so enticing. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of an interesting journey. I was talking to a friend of mine, another consultant one day at a client, and we were talking about kind of the next steps of our lives or what we would like to do one day. And, um, and she asked me at some point, have you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad? And uh, I hadn't read that book by Robert Kiyosaki. So I picked it up and read it. And I feel like it really changed my life in a lot of ways, blew my mind because it, it made me start thinking about things in a different way. I had a very, a very typical mindset that you would find in a lot of W2 people where, you know, I just was kind of working, trading my time for money and uh, putting, putting some savings into 401ks and really just hoping there would be enough there when uh, I was done working as I got older. That book made me start to realize, wait a minute, um, I can do the same thing that a lot of wealthy people do. And I, I might have access to this to be able to learn about and invest in other things. So through a lot of research, I quickly found real estate. And so, you know, over a course of a few months, probably almost a year actually of preparing and trying to learn things, I bought a rental property. And then as I did that, I, I kept continuing my education and I sort of found commercial real estate and apartment investing through that. And what I realized was, you know, the first of all, uh, buying a rental property is fantastic. I, I proved out the concept, but it would take me a long time to scale up to be able to get uh, to where I wanted to be. If I ever wanted to sort of replace my W-2 income, it would take a lot of houses. And it just wasn't practical. Also, I had always previously thought that uh, investing in commercial real estate was for people who either were wealthy or had been brought up into it or just sort of pursued that on the on the business side of things like in college or they pursued finance and that's not what I did so I didn't really think it was accessible to me but once I started to discover it actually is and I can do this as well um, I sort of found it at that point and realized this is the best way to build wealth over the long term. And that's why I went for it. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and I think that it's important what you said about scalability, because you're right. I mean, rental property investing is phenomenal. I mean, I know a lot of people mm -hmm. who have gained financial independence through that. Uh, but as far as scaling to a larger and larger portfolio, it's a lot easier to do with, you know, multifamily, in particular in your case with apartment investing, uh, when you do the grow the commercial route. So that's kind of interesting to hear you say that. Yeah. And you know, with a team, you can go much further as well. That's oh, one sure. other big component, right? Is oh, for sure. you can't really do apartment investing by yourself. Uh, I mean, I guess maybe you could if you stayed on the smaller side of things and went really slow. But, you know, if you just sort of put a team together or join a team like I did, you can start doing really big deals. Oh, for sure. And I think I, I imagine your background in Agile has probably helped you a little bit on that front as well. So that's pretty awesome. So as far as your particular background, because this is something you obviously have a podcast called Tech Guys Who Invest. So you obviously deal with a lot of people in the technical field. So could you tell us a little bit of some of the advantages and disadvantages of having a technical background when it comes to investing in commercial real estate? Yeah, yeah, I love that question. So we have the Tech Guys Who Invest show and what Kevin, my co-host and I are trying to do is really reach people like I was a few years ago who don't realize you don't have to just shove your money into a 401k and hope there's gonna be enough. You can take that and proactively start investing. Now, most of the tech guys that we work with, they love their job, they got into tech because that's what they love to do. And we get that. So they could still, though, invest passively with people like us, right, or whoever. And, and they can take control of their money and invest in a real asset. So that's kind of what we're focused on there with the show is helping people understand that. Now, one advantage technical people have to answer your question is most of them very analytical. Most of them are highly intelligent and able to quickly and thoroughly understand numbers and things like that. Interestingly enough, as it pertains to me personally, I'm not that. 
which is why I'm on the process side of things. I really come in and I sort of work with, with leaders of the business and help them understand the cultural change and how to build great teams and how to really approach product development and stuff like that. And I'm in the tech space. So I'm by osmosis, I'm probably more technical than most people that you would bump into like at the mall or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but compared to a lot of the guys I work with, I'm not technical because they're, they're literally writing the software that people in the world use every day. And they're doing that professionally. So those guys can really run numbers. They understand uh, logic very well, can do a lot of that. They can do a lot of abstract thinking in their head, which is interesting. Um, for me, what I use in Parlay is my people skills and the, the collaboration stuff. So I really try to bring that to everything I do. When I go to work on a team, I try and bring some of the things that I do with the teams in corporate to my teams. Like we'll do these uh, retrospectives, for example, where we inspect and adapt our progress over a period of time. And we'll get back together and say, hey, you know, how are things working for us? What do we need to improve? What do we need to stop doing? And let's make a little commitment and a, a mini action plan to sort of implement that stuff and continuously get better. Those kinds of things or what I'm bringing into commercial real estate investing. Oh, for sure. No, and I appreciate the the advantage you talked about when, as it pertains to analytical, uh, just analysis for different investment opportunities because technical people that I've interacted with, and I actually come from a technical background as well. I was in software for about four and a half years as well. So the analytical side of things is definitely an advantage. I've also noticed sometimes overanalyzing things uh, yeah. Some people, they just are like, okay, let me pull in every data point I possibly can before I make any type of decision. And that can obviously hinder your ability to actually pull the trigger, which at the end of the day is the only way you're going to actually go where you want to go. So I would say those are two of the things that I've noticed just from my peers and people that I've interacted with in the technical space as it pertains to commercial real estate. So, yeah, I totally agree about the disadvantage as well, because most of the people I run into who aren't doing this are in that spot right there. I mean, for some reason, there's a mental block there that tells them it's safer to put their money in the 401k than it is to just pull the trigger on a deal that they've analyzed and, and know is going to cash flow. So when you're analyzing different types of investment opportunities, what, what are some of the criteria you look for? Uh, obviously, you, you, you can't be everything to everyone. So I guess what is your narrow focus when it comes to investing? So we're looking at multifamily class B in the South, previously more the Southeast, but now we're starting to expand out to include Texas as well. And we're looking for things that require some sort of value add. It could be to the property itself in terms of updating interiors, maybe they're just outdated, physically need some love, or buy from someone who hasn't been managing the operation as a real business. And we do that. We have systems in place. We have processes and tools. So we manage our business very professionally. We can add value there. And we'll be looking to add that value, you know, usually over kind of a fairly typical hold period for a syndication, like a five to seven year period, for example. And um, then we will exit the deal at that point. So those are the kind of criteria we're looking for at a high level. Do you have any type of return criteria that you, you, you try to hit or metrics, I guess? Yeah, I guess we're usually in that, you know, first of all, most of our deals have a, a pref, like a 7% pref is pretty typical for us, a 70, 30 split. So, you know, 70% to the LPs or the passive investors who will be investing in the deal to, to raise the equity portion of the deal. And then um, most of our deals, you know, we're, we're usually looking somewhere around a 15 to 17% IRR at a minimum. And, um, you know, somewhere around like a nine or 10% cash on cash return. And those are just sort of our target marks there. And we try to get at or above that, or else it's just kind of difficult to get the deal to investors to attract the capital we need. That makes sense. Yeah. Cause there's two components of the deal, right? There's one where you have to be able to raise the money in order to raise the money. You have to kind of have a deal that is attractive enough to investors to want to put the money in that opportunity. So uh, it's right. definitely an interesting dynamic to, to deal with. Cause they like, can invest in another one, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and again, <laughs> was... 
the syndication model has become more and more popular over the last, you know, I would say five to 10 years. Um, so mm-hmm. I know there's, there's a lot of people out there that are looking to do syndication deals, uh, in particular in the multifamily space. So you do, you do have to be able to be competitive when it comes to the structure that you provide to your, your investors. So absolutely. So as far as being able to source deal opportunities, that's another thing that a lot of people struggle with in particular in the, in, when investing in commercial real estate is finding those opportunities. How do you guys utilize or, ne- or leverage your network to be able to source those types of opportunities? It's a good question right now. It's real relevant because we're having trouble finding good deals. Uh, we're you know analyzing a lot of deals. We're making a decent amount of offers, but uh, we're, we're actually having a little bit of trouble getting one under contract because the market is so frothy right now. It just seems like people are overpaying and that's making it pretty tough. As far as the source of those though, uh, a lot of them come from brokers we've established relationships with. That's something that was kind of difficult for me breaking into this in the beginning because everything was new to me. I didn't really have experience. I I didn't know uh, like some older person who could kind of mentor me a little bit into the, into the space. So what I was doing is using books and podcasts and trying to read blogs and things like that to figure out what to do. Well, it's very different from the single family to the commercial multifamily investing. So I was getting a little bit confused because a lot of the single family older not, not really gurus, but the experts, you know, the guys who they're legitimately these older guys who have been around and seen it, done it and lived through everything you can think of. And they're, they're talking about how, you know, you don't want to necessarily use realtors. You don't want to cut them off or anything like that, but you really want to try to go directly to the seller. And it doesn't really work that way with commercial multifamily. Most of the time, if you're lucky, you could do that. But usually you have to go through brokers or know someone. And so that's kind of what we've done is establish good relationships with the best brokers. So we're trying to find who are the highest performing brokers who have a good reputation for being professional and and ethical and uh, just doing a good job running a high quality firm in their market. And we've tried to establish relationships with those people. And then by closing deals and doing what we say we'll do, We've been able to establish credibility and that helps. So it kind of goes both ways. Now, interestingly enough, as you kind of develop your business, develop your reputation in the industry, sometimes they'll come to you, which is great uh, because then you can potentially get directly to the seller. Although a lot of times they'll still want a broker representing them. But, you know, we found a property, for example, through our property manager, of one of our properties who told us about another client they had who had this apartment complex for sale and we ended up buying it is great. So things like that will happen as well. So we're always networking and, and, you know, trying to get the word out there. So we, we do some marketing like direct marketing, like mail and, and things like that, but it's kind of limited in its effectiveness, especially right now where everyone sort of knows they can just throw their, place on the market and get above asking. So why would they pay some guy who mailed them a letter (laughs) less money than if they could just easily do that? And they don't even have to hassle with it. They just have a broker take care of everything. Yeah. And like you said, since the market is so animated right now, I mean, like they'll, they'll generate the interest. I mean, we, Mm -hmm. we get, we get interest for properties that we list, especially in the multifamily space from all over the place. You throw it on some of these national websites like Crexy or LoopNet or whatever else. And you get people from all over the place, just trying to bid on this, on these opportunities. So yeah, it's kind of interesting. And it's also interesting to hear you say the property management angle, because I've all, I've heard that on several occasions where people are like, oh yeah, like my property manager just said, Hey, by the way, this property is going to be coming available. One of my clients mentioned that he's interested in potentially selling. And sometimes the, the property managers are also licensed as agents. And so that's one of their incentives, I guess, to offer it to their, their clients. Absolutely. So I guess now that we understand a little bit of your background and everything else, could you tell us a little bit about your first commercial investment deal? Sure. I know you, you said you're part of a team. How, how exactly did you come across that? And then maybe talk about your first uh, commercial investment opportunity. Yeah, sure. Uh, a lot of it is networking and, and just kind of building relationships with people. That's what I've found. That, and 
that's kind of one of my strengths. So I played to the strength. I don't really know a better way to do it for, for me personally. So what I did is I just started really trying to go to local events, you know, pre COVID that was easier because you, you go to meetups, go to conferences, meet people, uh, through the podcast, we're meeting people and, um, just tried to get myself out there. And I met a guy at a local meetup and we sort of, you know, partnered up a little bit and tried to do another deal that didn't work out. We stayed in touch, uh, you know, fast forward some time and he reached out to me and he said, Hey, you know, I've partnered with this, this other guy. And so that's Nick and Viano there. It was Nick who I met and they're the guys at Dreamstone. And Nick said, um, we need someone to help raise a little equity. Would you like to raise some capital and add some value to the team? in other ways. And I'm like, yeah, I'd, I'd love to, you know, it was my chance. My foot in the door is my first one. And so they had a deal in Tampa and it was kind of an unusual one, which I can talk about in that it was a portfolio. So it wasn't like a big, you know, 80 unit apartment complex. Instead, it was several properties. Like there, there were a couple of duplexes thrown in there and a couple of 12 units and some, you know, it's just like this weird mix of properties. But doing your first deal, all of that stuff doesn't matter. You're really just trying to get your first deal done because brokers would sort of ignore me. You know, they would they'd be friendly, but not really get back to me on things and, and other people as well. Uh, I mean, you get that first deal done, all of a sudden they're calling you and, you know, everyone's like, hey, Adam, great job. Well, what that does for you is you'll, it sort of opens the door a little wider to get the next one. So that that's why that's good. And um, by establishing those relationships, I came onto the team. I helped raise some capital. And I said, you know, I, I like communications and I like sort of meeting people and, and things. So I could do investor relations for you guys and add some value to the team that way. And so that worked out pretty well. We were able to get that deal done in Tampa. And interesting thing about that deal is not only were there multiple properties in there to make up the portfolio, but there were two different owners. And, uh, if I recall correctly, at least one of them was not in the country. Uh, the second the second person, I can't remember if they were based here in the U.S., but I don't think they were either. Um, one for sure was in China. So he was physically in China during the negotiations. It was difficult to reach him. We thought it was hot back then. Uh, this was 2019. And essentially, the price of the property, in terms of its value, I should say, its value was rising while we were trying to get the deal done and we're waiting on some things to come back like some surveys and stuff that was just dragging for some reason and the guy in china was like the property has gone up and these guys are not wanting to pay me more so he starts trying to basically retrade or you know up the purchase price and and that was going to hurt the deal for us and then he started to get really unreasonable and ended up pulling out of the deal. So we, we lost like over 20 units when he said, you know, I'm backing out. And we though kept the rest of the deal together. So what it ultimately ended up becoming is a 59 unit portfolio in Tampa. And uh, it's been an interesting deal because it's a class C. Uh, it was pretty rough. So we have done a lot of improvements to it, really tried to make it a lot nicer, get a much better quality of tenant in there. It's in a gentrifying part of Tampa, which the nice thing about that is property values have just continued to climb in the area. But the tenant base was pretty rough in the beginning. And we're trying to get better quality tenants in there over time. Uh, COVID has hit that property harder than anything else in our portfolio. It's been a little tough on, on that way. But the thing is, uh, we bought it for 65 a door. Uh, right now, we, you know, we can probably get somewhere around 110 if we wanted to sell it. And that's pretty awesome to us. <laughs> I mean, 2x return in what, two years? I mean, that's, yeah. it's like a ridiculous, <laughs> ridiculous return. But, and also, you, you kind of learn, like you said, through that first transaction, you, you realize what can go wrong during a transaction. Because before getting into brokering, from in my end, I just got in broking around that time in 2019. I mean, you, you'd be surprised with the amount of stuff that just pops up during transactions that may or may not necessitate or resuscitate into some, some 
transactions not just not even going through. Um, so yeah, in that case where where that gentleman just decided to back out, I'm surprised that the contract language didn't have some sort of provision in there that kind of either restricted that or or penalized him for doing so. What happened was um, there was some stipulation the bank needed, and I, I believe it was a survey. And for whatever reason, the company was delayed and we had to delay a couple of times and that allowed him to get out because he was using that as the excuse the whole time. He was saying, you know, you guys keep delaying and, and we're supposed to close this already and stuff like that. Oh, okay. So it must have, it may have been out of your due diligence time frame or something. And in yeah. which case you were probably forced to, that makes sense. No, it, it's just kind of interesting to hear that he was just able to back out. But if that's that, if that was in fact the case, that would make sense why he was able to back out of the property. So as you guys have continued to scale your company, because obviously that was your first transaction, 2019, 2020, now 2021, you guys are continuing to try to scale your operations. What are some of the challenges that you faced as it pertains to just scaling your business? Scale uh, just introduces lots of new complexities and challenges. Uh, you know, the volume of workload goes up, of course. What they don't always tell you is it's a lot of work to run the properties. It's probably why we see a lot of them not run very well. Uh, but to, to actually run it well, you need systems, you need standardized processes, and uh, it, it just takes a lot of time to do that stuff. You really do have to stay on top of the property managers because uh, although they're professionals and you know you use a property manager whose specialty is the exact type of property you have, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's not their property and it's a business and things sort of fall through the cracks and it is your asset and you're trying to optimize the value of that asset for your investors. So you really have to stay on top of everything. You have to stay on top of the property manager and the operations. Uh, and, you know, there are just a lot of tasks and miscellaneous things that you have to do to run your business. So that's probably the biggest challenge is as, uh, as you add more, there's more of those things. And, uh, and so what we've done as a team to address that is use systems, use standardized processes, use tools. So, you know, those are some of the things we've done to help manage that growth. Oh, for sure. And I can only imagine, as you, like you said, as you start scaling, obviously the book E-Myth Revisited uh, is a phenomenal book that talks about, you know, systematizing your business so that as you start to grow, you can, you know, hand off responsibilities to the appropriate parties and, you know, continue to grow effectively. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that's something I've tried to implement in my business. Obviously, I'm nowhere near the scale of you guys at this point. But, but again, I try to document processes throughout the day that I think would be valuable as I continue to grow and be able to hand off some responsibilities, whether to an executive assistant or, you know, if we, if we start expanding some of the, on the brokering side, then obviously what are the responsibilities that an additional agent would require, et cetera. So I'm sure you guys do something similar in particular with your background in agile. I'm sure that kind of helps you guys as, as well. Yeah, it's great. Documenting your processes is so smart. Um, Nick is really good at that stuff because he has a construction management background. So he's used to project management, uh, construction project management. And so he's really good at that kind of stuff. And documenting things is a very good thing to do because it forces you to kind of articulate the actions you're taking. And then you can decide, is there, is there waste in that process? This, is this the best way to do this thing? Or am I taking like five steps I really don't need to take? And I could use that extra few minutes in my day. <laughs> 100% agree. I can't tell you how many times I've written out a process and then I'm like, why did I do it this way? This is right. so inefficient. And so I <laughs> correct it and obviously fix it. And then I've also been using like Zoom videos. So if mm -hmm. I, especially if I'm doing a process like on my computer, I record myself doing it and then I put it in like a folder. So I have my task and then the Zoom video with it. So that one point, once I hand it off, if there's any questions, it's like, look, look at the, look at the document. And then there's also a Zoom video that'll show you how to do it step by step. So so smart. Yeah, it's been it's been helpful so far. I mean, I haven't been able to, you know, hand it off to anyone yet, but at some point it will will take place. So one of the things you talk about a lot on your podcast is is helping people in a W2 profession. You know, if if they like the W2 profession, that's phenomenal. Just keep continuing to do it. But if, if you'd like to transition to do something else or really do something a little bit more flexible, obviously real estate could be a great resource for you to be able to do that. So what advice would you give to someone who's interested in investing in real estate and their full time uh, employees? Usually the first step I, I advise is education. 
start to educate yourself right away. Listening to podcasts like this one is a great way to do that. It's actually probably my favorite way is listening to podcasts like this. And you just learn things like building your own playbook, like you were just talking about. Uh, someone out there should probably be writing that down right now. And then, you, you know, they've just learned something super valuable by listening to the show. That's a great way to start. And then at some point, you know, at first you're kind of educating to see how it all works and what options are available to you. And then at some point you need to make a decision on what your investor identity is going to be. Like, what are you going to focus on? Because one thing a lot of people, including myself, fall in the trap of is the shiny object syndrome. Everything sounds super cool. Like I'm really interested right now in, in some way investing in RV, either storage or rental or make an RV park or something. I don't know why. It's just what I'm interested in this week. And a couple of weeks ago, it was something else like short-term rentals. I don't know, <laughs> but it's important to pick your investor identity, you know, large multifamily syndicating apartment buildings, over a hundred units, class B, you know, get that locked in and then focus on that. And, and that allows you to actually get productive and start to really dive into something and, and make it happen in that area. Because if you're just sort of fractured and your, your focus is divided, you, you really won't make progress on stuff. So once you know enough to know what options are, pick an investor identity and you know, try to pick one that aligns well with your goals because there are tons of different types of real estate investing. Like my co-host, he invests in notes and he's got reasons why that matches really well to his goals. That wouldn't align as well to my goals. Multifamily investing does align well to my goals. So pick something that does align to you and continue to educate yourself. Now focus on educating yourself in that area really dive in. I've got a bunch of different, you know, books on it now that I know what it is. The podcasts I listen to will be focused on that probably. I'll be reading blog articles based on that. And then I can go to conferences based on that. So I met my my partner, Nick, at a conference or a, it was actually a local meetup, but it was focused on the multifamily and apartment syndication that night right? That meetup had, had that topic that night. So because I'm focusing in on that now, things are starting to happen for me in that area. And then taking action, you know, moving beyond your fear and just doing things that will put you closer to your goals. Oh, for sure. And I love the fact that you say focus because I can't tell you how many different events I've been to where people talk about one thing one week and then one thing another week. And then it just becomes just a pie in the sky type concept versus just focusing on the one thing like Jay Papasan says in the, in the book is a phenomenal book where it talks about if you focus on one thing and, and dedicate yourself to that number one, things just start naturally gravitating and working towards you. Like you were able to meet your business partner, Nick, by being able to go to the meetup that was strictly focused towards multifamily. Now you, you gravitate towards like-minded individuals. You start brainstorming on different ideas and you start moving forward and, and having deliberate action in one direction. So uh, that's some great advice to be able to share with someone. And one of the cool things about that I did in particular when I was when, in my W-2 job was, you know, getting into like a house hack, for example. Uh, that could also be a good yeah. opportunity just to lower your expenses and just kind of be able to uh, at least get started in the space without having to, you know, go full force into it right off the bat. So I love that stuff. I mean, just getting started in some way and, you know, getting that education allow it'll open your eyes to many options that are available and you can do things along the way like that and just do things that will align to your ultimate goal. So something like a house hack is, is really awesome because you start to learn a lot of things about having someone pay you for a place to live. And, you know, what it's like to, to run into some of the things that they're going to need or, you know, issues that may come up as a result of that, how to collect the money and, you know, how to keep track of it and all of that. You can apply that to the, whatever it is you're going to do, what your larger goal is. Oh, for sure. And it helps you learn how to manage your property manager because you know what it's going to take to manage your property because you do it yourself, at least starting out. That's, that's how I did it. Mm -hmm. um, I did too. You know, 
Yeah. And you, and you just learn a lot of things about how do you effectively manage your property manager? Because if you don't know what they do, you know, just hand off responsibility to the property manager right away, you may or may not know whether or not they're doing a good job. But if you know that, Hey, this is what needs to be done. You know, rent needs to collect it on this day. Grass needs to be cut on this day, et cetera. You, you can be able to uh, effectively manage your property manager. So great advice. So you obviously are the co-host of uh, Tech Guys Who Invest podcast, uh, which is a phenomenal podcast. If you guys haven't got a chance to check it out, I would highly recommend you do. Uh, he has some phenomenal guests on there and him and his co-hosts really have a great dynamic going. Uh, but as far as maybe some of, if you could talk about some of the benefits of what you've been able to accomplish with the Tech Guys Who Invest podcast, because one of the big things we talk about on this podcast is building your brand and being able to leverage mm -hmm. relationships you gain from the brand building in order to advance your commercial real estate ventures. So if you can kind of talk a little bit about that, that'd be awesome. Yeah. The podcast has been huge. I mean, it's one of the best things I've done. And Kevin and I met in a, a coaching session, kind of like how you and I met, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we met in a coaching session and our coach said, you guys should do a podcast. A and Kevin and I were like, yeah, we should do one together. And we, you know, we just started talking about it. it like we have good chemistry. It, it made sense. And we both say that's the best thing we could have gotten out of the class uh, or the, the program. And we learned tons of other really good stuff there, but the podcast has just been amazing. And as you said, we've built a brand there and it's been good for us to attract people to us. It's been really good for us to attract a lot of uh, you know, different people that something potentially could happen with. And in some cases it has, right? So you'll, you'll have people that you will convert to invest with you. You'll also have people who may just introduce you to someone else who becomes a key relationship for you in some way. Uh, so there, there are just lots of good things that can happen out of that. In addition to that, we have met some people that there's no way we would have met if we didn't do this. Uh, met some some really cool people like Kathy Fecky and uh, Rod Cleef and some people like that who I, I think it was it was neat to meet and get to talk to for a while. And then they come on the podcast and just share all kinds of interesting things and add tons of value to the show. And then people get something out of that. So it's been great. And then I guess lastly. Uh, just helping other people is fantastic. It makes you feel good. Like what you're doing here, Raphael, is great because, you know, you're adding value into people's lives and uh, that's just super rewarding. And, and I think that comes back to you, you know, like you're rewarded for that and uh, other people will add value to you in some way. Oh, for sure. Um, and, and like you said, I mean, giving back in some capacity is important in everything you do, especially with the skills that you develop in your profession. So if you're able to, you know, compart some wisdom and, and share some of your experiences, I can imagine, you know, obviously sharing your experiences with people who come from a technical background could maybe just trigger a light in someone and say, wow, I mean, maybe this is something that I could pursue. Or maybe if it's not something that they could pursue, they could pass it along to someone else and that could trigger their kind of light bulb moment. So that's, that's great advice. And, and also the leveraging the relationships, like you said, you're able to meet some very prominent people in the space that you probably wouldn't have been able to meet had you not had a platform that they could share their information or whatever else. And now you have that connection long-term. You, you may see them at a conference or you may meet, interact with them at some other point in time. And that connection has been made, whether it's, it's a, a small connection or not, it's, you know, it's that connection. So uh, yeah. I think brand building through podcasts, YouTube videos, whatever is extremely important. So you know, one of the biggest ones I forgot to mention, uh, we had Brian Murray on the show and he's the author of Crushing It in Apartments and Commercial Real Estate. And we ended up becoming friends based on that. Like, uh, you know, we stayed in touch and have done things with him. Like he's, he's done some things uh, as a, a key partner with Dreamstone and that became an extremely valuable relationship that we wouldn't have had if he didn't come on the show if we didn't start the podcast. Uh, so that's been phenomenal. And then Gino from Jake and Gino, uh, Wheelbarrow Profits, he's been another one. You know, he's he's been on the show just like Brian Murray. He's a really good guy, genuine guy. So if you reach out to him, he responds. He doesn't blow you off. And then he has introduced me to 
someone who's been very instrumental in some things I'm trying to do. So yeah, it's just unbelievable kind of the things you can make happen from something like this. Oh, for sure, man. You guys are doing an awesome job. And like I said, if you ha guys haven't checked out the podcast, you should definitely subscribe and rate the, rate the podcast because it's a phenomenal podcast. So I guess one of the things we love asking our, our guests, uh, because obviously we're all learners and we want to ex continually expand our knowledge, what, is, what has been one of the most impactful books in your life? And I know you mentioned Rich Dad, Poor Dad mm -hmm. as being kind of that mindset shift book. Could you kind of share, I guess, either a little, elaborate a little bit more on that or maybe another book that was extremely impactful as well? Yeah. So my answer may not be exactly what you're expecting, but the, the most impactful book to me, the most um, life-changing book to me has been the Bible, actually. Uh, it's amazing that that has so much rich information in it. Uh, and you kind of go through different stages where you filter what you're reading through a different lens, depending on where you are in your life and how you understand it changes. But recently, what I've come to really understand and appreciate as I dive into it even further is it truly is a manual and a roadmap for our life here and how to live. And it's got all of these things you wouldn't expect in it that apply to business, managing your life, uh, and how to do things in a way that where your life will just be in harmony and sort of work better for you. So... Um, you know, kind of unexpected there, but, uh, but that one, and then, uh, financially, yeah, the, the rich dad, poor dad book was huge for me because it's a simple book and something about its simplicity has power because it just opens your eyes to a different way of looking at things. And, um, I think cash flow quadrant was also a good one as well, sort of like, a similar book, but it's almost like he expands a little bit more on some things. So I, I thought that was really good too. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and I, I, I relate to the idea of simplicity because, you know, sometimes the simple lessons are the most profound. I mean, I remember mm -hmm. the, the book that most impacted me was The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy, because you have this idea of, of thinking, oh, you look at the Richard Bransons, you look at Oprah Winfrey, you look at all these people who are doing huge things in life, and you're like, there's no possible way I could possibly do anything like that. But what you don't realize is that they started similar to where you were, but it's all small actions every day that add up to big results. And you know, having that example where it's like, you know, if you just accomplish five things a day, after three years, you look back, you're like, wow, how in the world did that possibly happen? And I apply that same logic to writing books. I apply it to the meetups. Now we're going to be applying to the same logic to the podcast. And, you know, it may take four, five, six, seven years, but I guarantee you, if you look back seven years from now, it's going to be like, wow, what a journey it's been. And I'm sure you've seen it in your, in your case. I mean, your first deal yeah. was in 2019. Now it's like 2020, 2021. You know, you guys have already been able to build this business and who knows what's in store for you guys over the next five to 10 years. I love that. Um, I'm going to have to check that book out. I haven't read it, but uh, what, what you're saying there makes so much sense. And I've seen that pattern play out uh, in my own life. It's absolutely true. You just get started and, you know, just make little bits of progress. You, you sort of overestimate what you can do in the near term, like in a week or a couple weeks or a month. Uh, and you underestimate what you can do over the long term, you know, like in a year or, or five years. And I look back at some of the goals. I, I'm a big believer in writing your goals down and then reviewing them and trying to make progress towards them. Look at some of my goals from a couple of years ago, and I'm amazed at how far I've come. But, you know, a lot of times I'll get up on a Monday morning and think, oh, man, I'm just not <laughs> making enough progress. But you look back, it's like, oh, wait, maybe. Maybe I'm doing better than I thought. <laughs> Hind hindsight's 2020, right? You see the progress you made after it's already been made versus, you know, looking in the future. Sometimes you're like, oh man, like there's no way that you can accomplish something. But no, I think it's great advice that you just shared there. That's awesome. Now kind of to round out, you know, the, the podcast episode, we like to ask our, our guests to provide either an item or, you know, some sort of resource to the CRE treasure chest. And what this is, is a repository of resources that we offer to our listeners to be able to learn more about commercial real estate topics. So I was just wondering what exactly do you, do you provide for the, the, the treasure chest today? Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity, Raphael. Uh, we have an investor identity canvas and it's free artifact. I sort of designed this from tools I use in my day job. 
a lot of large businesses will use business canvases, lean canvases and things like that to help them get a complex idea more focused and look at the things that are important to them. Well, the investor identity canvas helps you sort of align a real estate investing option with things that are important to you. So, you know, you can choose your investor identity and get it to match up with your goals. So you can get that for free on the Tech Guys Who Invest website. Go to canvas.tgwipodcast.com. Awesome. And I'll actually share that within the within the uh, podcast notes and also in the Treasure Chest repository as well. So you guys can have access to that as well. Okay. So I guess to round out the interview, I just wanted to see how can people first off learn more about you, be able to get in contact with you? What's the best way to do that? All right. Thanks, Raphael. I, I'd say um, go to tgwipodcast.com is one way. You can go to dreamstoneinvest.com. Uh, you can email me directly adam at dreamstoneinvest.com. And then you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, it's, you know, my name, Adam Yulry, U-L-E-R-Y. That's my handle. And tell me you heard me on this podcast. I get tons of uh, LinkedIn requests and don't always know where people are coming from, but it really helps a lot for me to have some context. So if you say you heard me on this podcast, I'll know exactly how you found me and we'll be happy to link in with you. That's awesome. Yeah. And I highly encourage you guys to reach out to Adam. He's a phenomenal individual and, you know, I'm looking forward to continuing the the relationship going forward. And yeah, I think it should be an exciting time in 2021. So Absolutely. awesome, Adam. Well, thank you so much for stopping by the podcast. Again, if you guys haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the, the, the podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to, you know, like, share and subscribe as well. Uh, if, if you're if you're listening on the podcast medium, be sure to drop a five star review. Uh, we we really appreciate your guys' support, and we'll see you guys next time.